Welcome to Event Experience by Visibo, the podcast where we bring the best and brightest event experience leaders together to share stories, tips, and lessons learned from creating some of the world's biggest events. I'm Rachel Moore, your podcast host. This week, grab your hard hats and tool belts because we're in full construction mode as we build a 365-day marketing machine to maximize post-event impact. Our expert builders, TED's head of events, Monique Ruff-Bell, co-founder and CEO of Audience Plus, Anthony Caneda, author of The Art of Event Planning, Gianna Gaudini, and of course, our moderator and Bizabo's vice president of marketing, Lauren McCullough. This discussion gives you the building blocks to effectively nurture and convert event-generated leads, build communities that cultivate brand advocacy and customer loyalty, and extend your event's reach through innovative repurposing of event content. Let's clock in and begin to build high-impact event experiences together. I'm Lauren McCullough, the Vice President of Marketing here at Visibo. All right, without further ado, I'm really excited to begin our journey to building a marketing machine that works 365 days a year. It is my pleasure to introduce our three distinguished speakers. First, we have Monique Ruffbell, who is the head of events at TED. Monique is known for her exceptional ability to bring stories and ideas to life on the global stage. With a career spanning diverse industries, Monique has mastered the art of creating immersive and impactful event experiences. Her previous roles include serving as the VP of events at Money 2020 and serving as the director of conferences at Haymarket Media US. Monique, welcome. Hello everyone, happy to be here. Amazing. Okay, you may recognize our second speaker from a recent episode of Visibo's Event Experience Podcast. Gianna Gaudini is an experienced event strategist, advisor, event thought leader, and author of the Amazon best-selling book, The Art of Event Planning. Gianna led global events at the led global events teams at Airtable, AWS, SoftBank Vision Fund, and Google. If that's not enough, she also created the million dollar event planning career course. Gianna, welcome. Hi, everybody. Happy Thursday. We're doing it. We're doing it. And our final speaker is Anthony Caneda, the co-founder and CEO of Audience Plus. Anthony is a visionary in the world of audience engagement and marketing strategy. His entrepreneurial spirit and keen insights have earned him a reputation as a thought leader in crafting marketing strategies that resonate year round. He was also the founding vice president of marketing for Gainsight. Anthony, we are delighted to have you to join us today. Thanks so much. Excited to be here. Amazing. All right, let's get started. So in our recent state of in-person B2B conferences report, 71% of organizers said that they struggle to prove in-person conference ROI to stakeholders. And another 43% of organizers identified fitting their event into the wider marketing plan as their biggest challenge, which is wild to think, you know, I feel like these are topics we've been talking about for years and years, but it is clearly still really acute. So let's get right into it. Gianna, I'd love to start with you. Especially thinking in the context of B2B events, how do you ensure the positive energy and on-site success from events really trans translates into giving your sales team post-event really actionable leads? Yeah, I think this is definitely top of mind. Is This is not a motion that event marketers are experts at, yet we need to be, especially in this day and age when we're expected to prove the ROI of every aspect of our events. So, you know, this cannot be an afterthought anymore. You really need to build your solid sales enablement strategy before the event, long before the event, I should mm -hmm. say. So thinking through the full attendee journey before you even get on site and, you know, how, how your on-site experience is really going to translate into positive mm -hmm. business outcomes, which are closed deals, maybe it's upselling, pipe acceleration and maturation, Whatever it is, you need to establish a good relationship with your sales partners, a clear handoff plan, and consider who's going to be the team on site supporting you. So I think a lot of times we're just thinking logistics. Who needs to be on site to execute you know, the event logistics? But we really need to think strategically about our customers who are on site and who from the company should be on site with them. 
who did they want on site? Is it the people handling logistics or is it people that are going to answer their questions? So do you have enough product team representation on site? Do you have the right sales team members on site? Do you have sales team members that are maybe matchmaking customers that want to speak to each other or customers with prospects? There are key strategic roles that you should resource in advance that are going to lead to not only positive outcomes for your attendees, so a positive return on their ROI, but will translate to a positive ROI for you. So really thinking through exactly who's on site and you know what they're doing on site to make the experience successful. So I will often pair a product team member with the sales team member and maybe the product team members demoing but the sales team members taking notes for follow up afterwards and you're tracking all this of course. So just little things like that that you're thinking through. Maybe it's you know curating special unique groups of customers that you think are going to want to speak to each other at the event and then connecting them afterwards for follow up or connecting them with your sales team afterwards. It's thinking through the content for after the event well in advance. You know, the last event that I planned, we actually had a member of our editorial team on site. We could have now used AI, but this was like right when AI was nascent. And we had her publish a blog post that was going to hit, you know, our channels immediately following the event. We also had our video crew on site interviewing customers, creating a sizzle reel that we could also launch immediately after the event, packaging that up with a post-event survey. So we're not only getting data that we need to inform you know, our next steps with these customers and what they want, but we're also giving them something that they can forward on to other team members and scale the reach. I could go on and on, but I know we've got other panelists, so I'll, I'll take a pause here. Oh gosh, yeah, no, I mean, you're you're teeing us up also for so much that we can continue to talk about. But Monique, I'd love to for you to just share your perspective and and especially for some of the previous teams that you've led as well, you know, how you've you've really kind of specifically when you think about that lead nurture in between events, how you've really managed that and helped your team think about it. I mean, Gianna just said everything that I wanted to say. She has some really great points I'm here sorry. for that. No, that's great because I actually wanted to throw a monkey wrench in this question real quick because you talked about festive drinks and I just would love to hear from everyone what's their favorite festive drink for the holidays. Mine is Coquito. I love a good Puerto Rican eggnog. But to answer the question, Gianna really talked about a lot of the pre-planning and that is the, the crux of everything here. You can't just think about it when you get on site about what does this look like for yourself. So we have a lot of conversations, especially at Money 2020, is what does a successful lead look like first? and really being on the same page about the definition for that. What is a long cycle versus a hot lead? And then how do we kind of get that over? And when do we get that information over to our team members? Because you want to strike when the iron is hot for those hot leads, you might have a little uh, more time for those long leads and really kind of understanding and defining what that looks like for your team. We also provide sales enablement support on site. So we'll have a sales lounge, right? And so mm -hmm. this is where clients can come to ask the questions of the team. They don't have to look for the team. They know exactly where they need to come. They can set up a, an appointment for more in-depth conversations. And so all of that information is being extracted from them coming to us, as well as us sending team members to walk the floor and to ask questions of our clients and really understand if, hey, it seems like you have a lot of questions. I can make an appointment for you to come to the sales lounge. And so when you start seeing some of that engagement, that's becoming a hot lead. And so that is helping us figure out how do we make sure that we're getting that information over to the sales team in a much more timely manner. So a lot of our stuff is happening quick because we're putting a lot of things in place to make sure it does happen quickly and that everyone is clear about how we're going to facilitate and help with the journey of sales leads, not just from a digital standpoint, but from an in-person standpoint. I love that, I love that. Could talk a little bit more about the sales lounge and the mechanics there. Absolutely. So we build a sales lounge where we have not all of our sales team members, but they have a time that they're in that sales lounge 
throughout the conference times. And so we'll have a, a person that is check-in, a receptionist or whatever, to make sure that we can, when someone comes to visit the sales lounge, we can direct them to the right salesperson to answer any questions. We also pre-sell our floor. So when you are there, you get to pick your location for the following year. So we'll sell out most of our floor already at the current conference via mm -hmm. the sales lounge um, opportunity. And so it's just like how you would do any other lounge. You would have support there. We also hire support to help with the sales lounge. So it's not just a reception. There's actual companies that have exhibit sales support for you that you can hire mm -hmm. to bring on site if you don't have enough support in-house that will also serve as an extension of your sales team. So you, you might have only five, six, seven sales team members there, but there's 10 more from that exhibit place that can help facilitate um, more engagement with the attendees that are coming to visit the sales lounge. I hope that helped answer your question. I think I think it was great. I really I just am I'm already feeling like so appreciative of this conversation that we are not just kind of talking of just the normal boring things that you would Google and see kind of in lists of like how to better manage my leads. Like we're these are really I feel like good inspiring ideas that that people can put into practice already. Anthony, I, I would love to get your perspective, especially kind of from where you sit, kind of more yeah. having sat in that CMO role several yeah. times over. I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Yeah. A few things just to build, because I completely love this kind of pre-event focus on thinking about outcomes before we even kind of show up to the actual show. A couple of things, after having done the event for a few years, I think there were two things that were helpful. First, we built equity in the event in for our employees, for our teammates who saw the power of hosting this in-person experience and the value of it. Second was we started to have some data. So we can start to tell a story internally around, okay, if we were, if you're an SDR and you're able to host a meeting for the first time by getting somebody to the event, there's a higher propensity that that opportunity ends up being created. Or if you're an AE that has, has their, you know, your leads, your deals that you're forecasting to close in the next couple of quarters. And if they come to the event, there is like a two X improvement on sort of win rate customers. Like there's some crazy stat we found that if a customer did not come to our event, our event, our kind of major kind of flagstone event, they were at risk of churn. Like the, the mm -hmm. conversion rate, like that they're on a almost guaranteed path to churning. So we started using this data to actually start incentivizing the team. And so our SDR team had a quota for driving registrations uh, to the event. Our AEs did as well. And we started looking at booking meetings in the, you know, we, we refer to it as Gianna did in the uh, chat executive briefing center that we would create on site. Customer meetings would happen there. So sales lounge kind of concept as well. And it started to become just sort of a key kind of program in the overall revenue engine. And we all know like this isn't just about driving revenue, but I think it's a, the theme of today but something just magical happens when people get together in person and we can't, you know, there, there are many ways we try to replicate that virtually, you know, like we are here today and, and it's good and it's important, plays a big role. And I think we'll talk more about it, but thinking about how we get people in person has this sort of like, you know, exponential impact on actually driving business. So I think my big takeaway was how we sort of gathered data, how we incentivize the team to actually drive participation and then how we show up and how we actually operationalize that experience in person. And then I think as, as we'll talk about follow up, you know, post facto to, to drive the relationship forward. I love it. I love it. I mean, let's let's just keep going. So I think kind of moving into the kind of that next most requested topic that that we we heard from from everyone who registered here, I think specifically focusing on event content. So all of the things that you create for your event, whether it's your keynotes and your decks and your session recordings, all of those things I think too often just get put on a shelf after the event. And we all know how much work work, work, hours, 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 and revisions go into creating those things. And I think one of the, the real opportunities uh, when you think about building a 365-day machine is about repurposing. And so how can you take the things that get created for your conference and turn those into podcasts and social posts and audiograms and blog articles? And I could go on and on and on. And just a fun fact for us, and I, you know, for this webinar, you know, we've really gotten ourselves into a, a good motion that we turn our webinars into podcast episodes. We do 
recaps on our blog. We do obviously tons of social sharing as well. And we have found that it is a pretty low lift to do that, especially once we built that motion. But Anthony, I think, you know, this is yeah. bread and butter for Audience Plus. I would love yeah. to kind of for you to talk more about just content repurposing and, and, and how we can all do better at that. Totally. Well, we just see how, how powerful events are from a content creation perspective to your point, whether it's happening on stage or in like a dedicated studio or testimonials, whatever we're doing kind of on site. And so I think that the, these worlds are starting to blend together, like the content marketing world and the event world. And I think the commonality is there is an audience of people that we're trying to reach. We're trying to kind of facilitate relationship with those people, whether it's education or entertainment, inspiration, kind of name your kind of value you're trying to unlock. But then for a lot of companies, like you're, we're selling a product too on the other end of some of these things. And so we want to look for the right folks within that audience that are able, that are showing interest in, in taking a meeting or, you know, learning more about our products. So as these formats are, are merging, we're starting to say, okay, you know, we, if we have a 45 minute keynote or panel, you know, we have that footage coming to us, what do we do with it? In the old world, I think it was like, well, as soon as the event's over, we stand up like the library and we, in the post event email, we drive people to it. Here's what you missed, that sort of thing. And I think what we're learning is like, uh, first of all, attention is just changing so much. Uh, our ability to you know, count on our audience to sit through all 45 minutes is is harder just than it used to be. I think our brains are like literally changing in the TikTok kind of reality that we're all living in now. And so it's not to say people are not going to sit in and watch the whole thing, but what are the sort of, you know, snippets or the kind of key moments within the longer kind of session that we can clip into a shorter form piece of content and distribute it on what we refer to as rented channels. So places where we don't have that direct relationship with our audience it could be LinkedIn, could be YouTube, could be all of these kind of different places. And the intention in doing so isn't necessarily that people are just like, watch the 30 second thing and then move on with their day. Although you know, for the majority of, of folks, that's what they'll be doing. It's to get them to then kind of capture their attention and get them to click on back to our website to view the whole thing um, or some you know concise kind of version of, of the post you know produced version of, of the whole thing. So I think in so doing, what we're doing is we're extending the value of the event uh, after the event has transpired for folks that have not attended the event we're creating some FOMO, right? And they want to potentially come back next year, but they're showing interest in actually learning. And this topic that the event is all about, Money 2020, like if you're interested in the financial kind of, you know, FinTech kind of movement or what have you, like you're going to learn and to grow and to find the next step in your career. I couldn't make it in person, but I'm following and I'm engaging. And that's all great signal for us as marketers to say, well, look, they might attend next year. They might be interested in our broad, broader products. And we're kind of tying the event program into the broader marketing effort around capturing and engaging and hopefully for the right members of the audience converting into revenue. So tactically, there's many ways to kind of, you know, slice the videos up and, and there's some great AI tools that I've seen recently that like look for the right heat maps and all of those types of things. But I think the, the why behind it is the, the name of the webinar, right? How do we then connect everyone between these big tentpole moments and build that relationship uh, over time. I, I think you you shared so much that was valuable. I think one of the things I definitely want to call out is the idea of the FOMO. And, and I would kind of, I think, take that even a step further. And it's that the opportunity, you know, the people that are coming to your events are in, the, in some ways, they're the people you've already convinced. They're the ones you've already yeah. won over. And the opportunity to kind of nurture that next crop that next generation of advocates and to, to give them the breadcrumbs that they need that, you know, maybe next year can be the year that they get approval to go to TED. Monique, Monique, TED, the most, you know, one of the most, I think, you know, events, event brands, but also content brands. And I would love for you to kind of pass it to you and just, yeah, talk about some of the hurdles that, that you've had to overcome when, with some of your recent events and content repurposing. So I think you're going to probably hear this a thousand times today, but pre-plan, pre-plan, pre-plan. Mm -hmm. And we put together a content 
adoption, adaptation plan for different formats, right? So you know going in what your content is going to be, and it takes a lot of time to adapt it into different types of format. And so it takes different team members to play a part in that, right? So we release a lot of our content on various platforms. We are known for our content and our powerful storytelling. It is a lot of pre-planning that Mm -hmm. goes into that. So for example, we just did our TED AI event. It was heavily technical with some of the content that was there. That might not do well for what we call TED Talk, not necessarily TikTok. That's what our channel is on uh, TikTok. And so we really had to think about what type of adaption had to happen in making sure that we were going to continue to put it on that platform. How are we going to edit that properly to attract the the type of people to look at that type of content? So you have to kind of pre-plan and understand like, We in one conference do 88 TED Talks, one conference. And so we have to really think about our scheduling of how we're going to release our TED Talks from each of those um, sessions. So one conference is 88 TED Talks. I have another conference that's 45 TED Talks. I have stuff that's happening all over the world. We have 3,000 TEDx events. How is all of that going to be planned and put onto our various different platforms and adapted. And so you have to get buy-in at the very beginning for all of the people that have to help to make that happen. And so pre-planning, putting a strong plan together, putting a strong calendar together, how are you going to adopt it to different platforms? How do you need to cut it up and edit it? You might say, instead of 88 of these talks, we know we're going to go with a strong 10. And what does our strong 10 need to make sure that they're covering that we're going to release and put it on various platforms? We have podcasts, we have audio files, we do stuff on our websites. We really kind of repurpose our content in a dozen different ways. Not a lot of people um, in our industry have teams that big that can do that. So you have to be very selective then of what you can do and or pay for outside support but it's really important that you pre-plan a game plan of how you're going to um, cut up the content and making sure it's the right content to attract the right audience you're trying to attract. Repurposing takes time. It's not done properly. You have to make sure it's relevant. You really have to map up that calendar and make sure that it's really, really for your core audience. We'll be right back with more event experience after the break. From backstage to the spotlight, the Event Experience Podcast by Bizabo gives you a front row seat to the event industry's most captivating stories. Want to get more out of each episode? Visit bizabo.com slash podcast. That's B-I-Z-Z-A-B-O dot com slash podcast. For show notes, transcripts, links and resources mentioned in each episode, and more. The Event Experience Podcast by Bizabo, where events become unforgettable experiences. And we're back, rejoining the discussion and about to dive into ways that user-generated content can take your event even farther. Gianna, I would love, you know, either if there's, you know, you want to kind of touch on just some of your own content repurposing, but also, you know, for you or for the group, I would love to also just, I think the idea of, of, you know, especially for those of us that are creating just really photogenic, inspiring experiences, which again, like that is the goal. Uh, I want to be wowed when I'm coming to these events. I'd love to kind of hear a bit about if anyone has ideas or has seen great examples or had good success with some of the user generated content and how to use those. In, in some of that post-event marketing as well. Yeah, okay, so there's a lot to cover here. Where to start? I think, let me start with the first part and then I'll get into the second part that you mentioned. So first of all, everything that Monique and Anthony said, strong plus one, this is why it's so fun to speak on a panel. I think the other themes that I like to think about when I'm thinking of like, you know, sitting down for planning an event and content strategy for the year is like, Let's minimize waste in every form. So from a sustainability perspective to like everything that we're investing in on my budget spreadsheet, we're going to repurpose that in some way to inclusivity. So making sure that we're being inclusive in person as well as in the way that our our content is digested. Some people prefer to read. 
Some people prefer to listen. Some people want to be in person. And then full funnel coverage. So making sure that as we're mapping out our event calendar for the year, we're looking at every stage of the funnel, what audiences we're targeting and like, how can we reuse content from one event for maybe a different stage or a different audience? And then where can we integrate into our campaigns? So understanding our campaigns up front is going to help us source the right speakers, the right content mm -hmm. for these big marquee events. And then once you have that, you can plan the calendar so that you're rolling it out appropriately to the right people, the right stage of the funnel in conjunction with your sales team and their cycles. So that's point one. Point two is when we're thinking about more in-person events coming back in these you know, I'm thinking of the ones that are the biggest investments. You know, they are some of the marketing budget's biggest spend. And as we're all, I think we're all feeling that we need to be able to justify every dollar that we're spending on events these days. So as I'm thinking of events, I'm thinking of like, okay, the stage that we're spending money to build. Let's do this more generic branding for our brand so that we can repurpose every photo that we take of our executives on that stage on our website or you know for our recruiting team so how can mm -hmm. we repurpose in that way as well it's not necessarily content but it's leveraging everything that you're doing for one event for another similarly we all know that we can use platforms like visibo or you know hublo is another great platform that i advise to use ai tools to repurpose splice and dice you know the content into different formats via text or maybe it's like a video snippet or audio or generating a podcast from a speaking session like this i think there's other opportunities too to be smart with the people that are coming to your event and how to leverage them for content opportunities on site so things i've done in the past are like set up a clear podcasting station and be doing podcasts with these great customers you know people's time is money and it's a lot harder to get them to your studio, but if they're already coming to your event, it's a lot easier to seal the deal and have them record something for you on site, especially if you're wowing them with a great experience, they're way more likely to say yes. And then that also kind of creates a really cool moment at your event that people are intrigued by. You might get some mm -hmm. on-site signups. So just being really smart about like the experience that you're creating, how you can get other people. I've streamed speakers at events like at VIP summits where we have C levels, I've leveraged them to then stream to a global audience and scale the event reach by like thousands. And this was way, way back at Google in like 2013 before virtual events was even a thing. We had this mm -hmm. concept that worked beautifully. So I, right. I think you can just get super, super clever about hey, if we're investing all this money to get people here to build this beautiful experience, like what are all the different ways that we can leverage it for other opportunities in our calendar? So good. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. All right, I'm going to keep us moving along because I want to make sure we get as much time with you, both all of you, as possible. Um, so let's quickly turn our attention to event communities. Um, another thing I think that we talk a lot about and I think has still not kind of been universally nailed, but, you know, I think I would love Monique just to go right back to you to talk about TED, which again, I think we all are, many of us are part of that vibrant community. So I'm curious, you know, how you channel the inspiration from TED events to create just a continuous cycle of engagement and, and how that just continues to strengthen the brand. Yeah, it's a really good question because remember, TED isn't a B2B event. You don't right. come to TED to do business. It's not yeah. necessarily even, I wouldn't say a standard B2C type of event either. It is literally, you are you want to invest your time because you are a curious, lifelong learner. So we call our um, events uh, the playground for the curious. And so you're really going to take a lot of time out of your schedule because our conferences don't run like a standard conference. It could be three to five days, morning until night of uh, TED Talks, discovery sessions, workshops, dine around experiences, experiential activations, building and being creative in different ways that we kind of bring the community together, literally from eight in the morning until 10 at night for five days straight. Wow. And so you really have to have a vibrant community of people who want to participate in an experience like that. So we always think about how can we give people what we like to call a TED ache? 
And so <laughs> what a headache to us is they leave saying, oh my God, I've never felt this way before at any type of experience and I want to come back. So we call that an emotive experience. How do you create emotions for your attendees that are either joy, inspiration, gratitude, empowerment, curiosity, connection, confidence, hope, awe, inclusion. We think about all of these different emotive experiences and we map out our journey and our different experiences at our events to create that type of um, emotion. Because when you have emotions, create memories, memories create connection. Connection means someone wants to repeat that experience with you. And that's what we're always thinking about. And that's what builds a community. We also think about how do we let this live beyond just the three to five days. So we actually mm -hmm. keep our app open all year round, 365. And so people who meet each other at these different TED experiences can always go into the app and send a message to that person that they met and continue to connect with all year round. We also do something called an advocate program. So we have um, what we call TEDsters. They are like, they love TED and they love to kind of host their own TED-like events on our behalf. It's not necessarily sanctioned by us. We don't put any funding in it. They just let us know, hey, we wanna bring the community together. Can we do that? And so we created something called TED Socials. And so we let our community host TED social programs throughout the year. Someone just recently hosted a garden party for us where I attended and we had our, our lovely brunch hats. And it was a really great experience that we kind of helped invite some of our community to have. And the only thing they wanted to do was connect with each other. And so we think about how do we utilize the community where we don't have to do the planning, we don't have to do even the paying or anything like that. They just love TED and they want to keep feeling that TED ache. And so how do we kind of give them the tools to leverage that and create these connections on our behalf? So we're always thinking about 365, how does the community support each other and how do we help support the community? Amazing, TED ache is uh, just, that's, <laughs> that's beautiful, I love that. <laughs> Gianna, I love your perspective on, you know, how important do you think it is to kind of offer additional networking opportunities, whether it's like a VIP after party or an exclusive Slack for people to kind of schmooze pre post during all of the event. What's your perspective on that? So first of all, I think it's interesting what Monique said, you know, Ted is such a well-known brand and beloved by so many people, myself included. I'm I'm a, what did you say? A Ted? I'm a Ted star for sure. <laughs> but, you know, I think the majority of brands don't have that luxury and really need strong community moderation to keep that community going. It's not like you set it up and it runs itself. And so I would say if you have this grand idea to start a Slack channel to spin it up after an event, that's great. And I could, I've seen those be extremely mm -hmm. successful. I think they can also be extremely unsuccessful if you expect it to just go because you set it up and you invite people to it. So what I've seen in my experience is, you know, a community is only as strong as how you build it and how you engage with it and promote engagement on it. And so, you know, if you do not have a dedicated community manager at your company, which is ideal if you have one, one thing that I did at Airtable recently, when we lost our community manager and we needed to keep that community going, is all of us on the product marketing, event, content, editorial team just took turns moderating the community. And we came up with a schedule of questions. You know, we put our own unique spin on it. We took turns moderating on a weekly basis. And so I think you can get a little bit creative and what we found was it was great for us because we not only learn more about the community that we were all serving on our own channels, but we gave our community fresh faces to interact with, fresh perspectives. So it ended up being kind of a win-win. So anyways, I, I do think that like you have to be careful and put the time and the thought into how this community is going to run because you don't want it to fail. You don't want it to become something that, pe you know, that becomes like a, not a good thing for your brand. And I, I think you do also want to set a strategy in advance, like what do you want people to get out of it? And what do you as a business want to get from the community? And, you know, that's kind of a, a nice way to have a guiding principle as you start building, nurturing, engaging with your community. 
And then the other thing I will say about the VIP experiences after the event is I think that they can be extremely effective when it comes to segmentation with events. So what I've seen often is when you're trying to put together an event and invite different segments, especially at different levels, so C levels on down at the same event, um, it can be really challenging to get C levels to attend because they want to only attend events with other C levels generally. But if you can promote them coming to a VIP after party or give them an extra carrot to attend where it's going to be, you know, with their peers, they'll be with exclusive speakers or guests that they really want to meet with, it'd be a great way to incentivize them to A, come to your event, B, stay to the end of your event. And so I, I have seen that be really successful in that regard. I will pause because I know we're coming up on time and I want to give Anthony a chance to speak uh -huh. as well. <laughs> yeah, no, please, Anthony, take it. Yeah, I mean, I, and look, a lot of my bias is B2B events and B2B conferences and those types of things. And so one thing that's coming to mind for me is like, you know, where have we been and kind of where, where are we going? And for me, where we've been, maybe in many cases still are today, community is sort of like a role or an initiative somewhere within the organization, like they're tasked after the event to like keep the conversation going, those types of things. And then we get distracted by the pipeline target being missed or like the revenue numbers or the budgets being, you know, impacted. And what where I see us headed as an industry is community goes from being sort of a, you know, side project almost to everything, like the front end to how we go to market. And so I listened to Monique talking about Ted with great admiration and wonder how can I, as a B2B marketer, build Ted for my audience? What is the Ted ache equivalent for B2B marketers or whoever it is that you're targeting sales professionals? And in, through that lens, I think that just shifts a little bit of our thinking where everyone we are marketing to, who's getting our newsletters, who is opting into a relationship with our brand, like there's, an, there's a journey here of which these events are an important part of it. Engaging with the content after the event or maybe even before is, you know, a, a key milestone as part of a longer end. And the end is this exchange of value and this relationship. At the end of the day, as marketers, we're trying to scale the ability to build relationship using, you know, channels and other things that that we've you know that we've kind of built some mastery around. And so I think there's almost this renaissance coming a little bit where this is sort of at the heart of everything that we're doing. And you know, in so doing, the the revenue will come. Like if, if we can build relationship, if we can build trust, if you can be the brand that people want to follow and engage with, then when they're ready to buy, they're going to think of you. So anyway, that's just as a reflection that's coming to mind hearing both Gianna and, and Monique talk is I, I, I think that there are so many good, like, like, the marketing playbooks from the revenue marketing demand gen side of the house that have gotten us here, they're not the playbooks that are going to get us into this next generation. And it's more along the lines of what we're talking about today. Ooh, that is the, the quote of the webinar, I think. So I, I really, gosh, I feel like we could all keep talking for, for so much more time, but I do want to make sure that we take some time for questions. Before we do, we are going to say goodbye to Gianna, who has to jump to another event. Gianna, you have shared so much and been so generous. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It was so much fun. Amazing, amazing. Gia asked, she asked for the panel's thoughts about putting some spend behind booth and sponsorship versus spend behind sending um, just some, your, your extroverted folks to come and attend, give them collateral and have them just walk the floor. Um, so I think Anthony, from the CMO perspective, do you have a one, one way or the other? Um, lean toward. No, I'm smiling because when I was a CMO of a larger scale company, trade shows were a huge part of our, our marketing mix, exhibiting, you know, what we tried to do was, you know, try to create some other programming that runs alongside the event as well. So we had the trade show, but that was also a way for us to sort of get people to the dinner that we were hosting or whatever it was that ran alongside the event. I'm smiling because now as a very small company, like with not as much budget, we're a little more scrappy. And so that sounds like a great idea actually to say, you know, can we send some attendees to just get some conversation started? But I think, you know, in all seriousness, I tend to believe there's a lot of value to exhibiting at conferences. And, you know, the question is, 
relative to where you are in your maturity. You know, a quick example, I reached out to some of my know Jason Lemkin. I think he's a proud Visibo customer at Saster. I reached out to him. I was like, hey, sponsored in the past, smaller stage company now. Like, what's the best, like smallest, cheapest booth you can give me? And he said, just don't do it. Just don't do it because you're gonna get lost in the noise. People are competing for attention. People are spending a lot of money on these things. So I think that's sort of the heart of it is like, well, how much, like if we're gonna do it, like we should find a way to invest and stand out. Yeah, yeah. I, I always, you have to love someone whose business uh, is built on on selling booths saying like, it's not, you know what? Not for you, not for you. That's how you know you can trust it, that advice. The power move on me too. Yeah, I was like, I was like, oh no, don't buy a booth. Like what? Uh, Can I just answer that a little bit? So for me, when I was running Money 2020, of course you want people to buy a booth, but we wanted to give people the experience that was going to provide the best ROI for them. And sometimes Mm -hmm. that wasn't a booth. So we made sure there were other opportunities that we created for what different needs are. So at Money 2020, yes, you want to be a you want to be a part of the show in some way because your name gets out there, people know you're there or whatever. But we would have it, okay, if you can't do a booth, we had a place where you can get a meeting room and you can get it through us Mm. and purchase that meeting. So you might, your business might be great on a more smaller, intimate experience, one-to-one, where the meeting room product worked better than the booth product. We also had smaller stands that weren't necessarily booths that did not have to be manned. 24-7 Mm. within those hours. So there were certain hours where we would promote that this was live for people to come experience. So that was another cost-effective way for someone to be a part of it without having to do the big shiny booth. But also, if you can't afford to be a part of that, a lot of now B2B conferences are creating meeting spaces. And so connection lounges where you can do, you can find a time, find your person, set that one-to-one. Don't walk around giving out your pamphlets on the floor. Be very smart about your time. Work smarter, not harder. And just really utilize these connection lounges. Really talk Mm -hmm. about sending, going and chatting with the people you really want to meet and say, I want to get 10 really good meetings out of this. And so I'm going to make sure that those 10 really good meetings can happen. And I'm going to make it through the connections lounge option that a lot of these B2B shows are now doing. And so just like I said, work smarter, not harder. Really think about what serves the best ROI ROI for you. If it's more intimate conversations instead of the big shiny booth, that is fine, but still try to be a part of the show in some way. That's good. I love it. Very authentic. So to Leah's question, I'd love to just kick us off a bit. I think, again, the the heart of the question is, you know, how to really kind of make sure that you are, that your conference content is the best that it can be, and it's going to be the most relevant, and then how to also then kind of translate it. And I think it, it really kind of segues, I think, perfectly. First of all, I would say, you know, Click by Bizabo is, is an amazing piece of technology that gives you all of those data insights. If you're fortunate enough to be able to have that at your event, you'll be able to see heat maps and to gather check-in information from your attendees, from your exhibitors, really to see kind of what is resonating most with the people that are at your event and, and kind of see, you know, where people are, are going, where they're not going. And I think that is incredibly helpful as you plan for next year and, and beyond that. And then I think, you know, especially if you're working with content that already exists from your conference that you've already done, all of the exist KPIs and, and Anthony, maybe you want to just jump in quickly just to talk a bit about some of those KPIs to kind of focus on, to kind of gauge, this is good, this is, it's landing, it's not landing yeah. um, and how to kind of think about that. Yeah. I mean, I think about the, the first party data that we are collecting with tools like we're referencing with, with um, Visible Clip and others is we have some like a digital breadcrumb trail of knowing what is interesting to our audience. So I think that's a really helpful insight. I often say like, you know, we're moving from an overall content perspective, events included, I'd say into more of this like Netflix like approach to running marketing, meaning like we're using audience data to inform decision making as opposed to like search data or whatever we've used in the B2B context, you know, historically to feed our content roadmap and those types of things. So I definitely think what you're referring to is using actual first party audience data to make decisions is absolutely right. You know, zooming out, I'd say in the 
in the, you know, again, biased to my industry, but I, I think that research for your overall content approach, what are you talking about as a company and how does that resonate with your audience, both sort of, you know, from a utilitarian perspective, helping them solve problems, but also emotionally, like these are humans at the end of the day that are trying to solve a problem and being able to chart that course for the conversations that you want to have. I think that's a, an effort well worth doing in the broadest marketing sense. And I think events could be one major kind of manifestation of, of that content, those content pillars and priorities. So I would say I would, I would encourage any qualitative research or what have you earlier on before planning and probably revisiting it every year and forming it with the, the first party data in order to help make those decisions. Amazing. Monique, please. Oh, yeah, should I? So I have for, from two different approaches because TED is a very different beast compared to other events when it comes to content. Mm. We are known for <laughs> the content that we put yeah. together. So we actually have a full team of about a dozen content curators. We call them yeah. curators, where it's their number, their full time job to go out to find people to give TED Talks. So not mm. a lot of people have a budget or mm. the opportunity to hire full-time curators, not content programmers, curators. Yeah. And so that is a whole thing onto itself. And then when you're chosen, no matter if you are one of the best well-known speakers in the world, you still go through our three month coaching program. Mm. So we coach every single speaker that gets on the TED stage to give a proper TED talk. That is time and effort that you have to put in where some of us don't have the staff or the time to do that because we do large scale content. So let's put TED on a shelf. With Money 2020, one of the things that we did to help judge what type of content or that would resonate with our attendees is in our NPS surveys, we ask which mm. formats you prefer. Is it the interview style? Is it the standalone talk? Is it the panels or whatever? And what we learned is our attendees did not like panels. They didn't think they got a lot out of it. So we felt that there were probably some, because remember, a lot of people who you, you usually fill out surveys like to complain more than they like to give praise. Um, and so you got to kind of balance some of that feedback. But what we did understand was we had to reduce the number of panels. And that was one of our KPIs where we said every year we're going to start reducing our panels to a particular number that we wanted to do and do more of the standalones or the interview styles because those were the ones that resonated. We did mm -hmm. also do some type of content check-in, not let's get on a phone and you tell us your topic, let's get on a phone and walk through the entire discussion of that panel. And we would give suggestions on what we think would stand out. You need to talk a little bit more about this. Don't talk about that and give opinions. Give mm. So you had to have people from the financial services industry be a part of your content team because we were talking fintech and finance. So we had to hire from those industries to help us curate the right type of content. So it's very, you're going to have to put, if you're talking about market research, it wasn't just the standard market research. It was about us really making sure we hire people who understood what really reflected in that particular market. We took time to understand what our true audience needs. And we would ask the question year over year over year and act, then actually listen to them. And then we would actually put coaching and opinions into, I don't care if you were the CMO for MasterCard, we had, if we thought that we, you needed to add a little bit of this or take a little bit of that. And so really kind of caring about the content is extremely important because to me, I feel like it used to be the heart of the show was the content. I feel the experience is now, but it mm -hmm. still drives the business ROI for an attendee being the content. So it's still important. Oh, I love it. And, and I think honestly, the goal, the goal is to be able to kind of get back to a place where the, the content and the experience become one in the same in many ways. And, and I think that's really, that's maybe that's what uh, we're all going to work for in, in 2024 uh, and beyond. I hope, I think, I mean, I love, I just love us going like right to the last minute here. It's clear we could just keep talking forever, but Monique, Anthony and Gianna, of course, thank you so much for sharing all of these really, really valuable insights and I 
think I, ho I hope everyone is, is feeling the way I am, which is inspired. Thank you for making the time to invest in such an important topic. Thanks again to Monique Ruff-Bell, Anthony Caneda, Gianna Gaudini, and Lauren McCullough for this energizing discussion for event experience. And thank you for listening. If you're enjoying the show, we'd love to hear it. Connect with us on social and subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you're listening. Also, don't forget to share the show with your colleagues and friends. You can find transcripts of each episode and key takeaways on bizabo.com forward slash podcast. On behalf of the team, thank you. We'll gather again soon for a new episode of Event Experience.